Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, I think the majority of our attendees right now are staff and we have a few students. Um, and uh, I, I, I thank you guys for taking the time to come on board. Uh, today we are going to, it's actually the first of our many activities to launch the SDH mascot, which is the otter. Um, we thought one of the best ways of uh, uh, launching this is to get someone who's an expert. And uh, thanks to the Jane Goodall Institute, we were introduced to uh, Professor Siva, who is referred to in Singapore as the otter man. Uh, I just wanted to start by explaining to everybody, firstly, why are we, have we decided to choose the otter as our mascot? Um, it has, I mean, based on research, we find that it's a friendly, sociable, fun-loving animal. Uh, it represents empathy, hospitality, camaraderie, uh, and resilience because they survive. Right, they and they are in a lot of ways uh, proud of their territory uh, as well. So all these qualities and the fact that they have suddenly become so prevalent in Singapore uh, makes it a fantastic choice as a mascot. Right. So these were some of the things we considered. It took us a while, brainstormed, and came up with it. And we call this otter. Ollie, spelled O-L-L-I-E. That's the, that's the affectionate name that we are giving it. Uh, and this, you're going to see more of Ollie uh, in our uh, marketing materials, in our communications with you. Um, and before all that becomes part of our lives, I thought we could start the whole process with a talk on otters They'll give us some good information about otters and how they suddenly, how they start in Singapore, what happened to them, and then how they came back, and uh, some characteristics of the otter uh, and how they survive, right? Um, the best person to do this for us is Professor Siva, who's an expert in otters. And um, we hope to get some, uh, we will be getting some very nice information from him. So. At the end of the, he's going to talk for about 30 minutes and then he's going to give us a lot of time to ask questions, right? And I'm sure that all of us here have a hundred questions to ask. So um, without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Professor Siva uh, to tell us about otters in Singapore. Thank you, Professor Siva. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Siva or Ottoman. Glad to be with you. But why is everyone's uh, video off? Yes, can we have everyone's camera on, please? <laughs> so y'all hospitality feel, right? Y'all cannot be as lame as my science students. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we are hospitality students, so let's set yeah. a good example. I'll show your face. <laughs> also, it gives me the speaker, you know, facial feedback, right? Sure. So I know if I'm boring you and to move on. Yeah, so in, in the current economy, you got to be comfortable uh, working on Zoom. Cannot hide your face. Uh, it's a very important principle to realize, right? Even science students are being forced to realize that. So it should be a default for you, right? Turn up, show your face, stimulate the speaker. Okay, so um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the author. Uh, we are lucky in Singapore because we got a ringside view to how we might return to an urban uh, city. And I'm from National University of Singapore. A long time ago, I started working on hotels. At that time, they hadn't returned to Singapore. Lah. We thought they might return in the 90s and they actually did. So that was a quite a lovely surprise. Now, the reason why we are surprised is because uh, otters were part of our natural landscape in Singapore. And like many animals 
you know, elephant, tiger, or what have you, they all disappeared, right, as uh, Singapore developed. Now, the development of Singapore, there's two, two phases. Now. One is colonial period. So there's real exploitation of the land, right? And by 1900, most of, you see, the greenery is gone. A uh, forester who came down to examine it was quite shocked. Uh, in all of the street settlements, so Penang, Malacca, and Singapore, the exploitation of land was so uh, aggressive that even the local climate had changed. So what you see of green Singapore is really recovery from that time, right? Uh, so, uh, okay, what I mean by recovery from that time, if you want to see ancient forests, millions of years old, uh, go Malaysia, go Taman Negara. Okay, in Singapore, there's no ancient forest. There's a couple of pinpricks, but they are less than 0.05% of our land cover. Okay, so everything that we see, which is green, is very precious, right? It's brought back with a lot of effort. So there were originally two species of otters in Singapore, right? A small claw otter whose fingers are like ours, you know, the webbing is not complete and then the nails are not long. Uh, they are like fingernails because they will grab small little fish and crabs. Uh, and they're actually very good at juggling stones. Uh, the other one, the smooth coated otter, that's a fish eater. So it's bigger, it can dig very well and it can catch large fish. Right? But by the 60s, uh, no more records. Right. When I was looking through the literature when I did my work, right, couldn't find any more referencing to authors. There was one person who said they are occasionally seen. And then after that, they would disappear. But it's not surprising. The Singapore you see is highly developed. So when we had our independence, right, 1965, complete independence, uh, whether we wanted it or not, uh, we went into a massive urbanization mode. So that's for survival, right? And that meant that a lot of the natural forest was gone, right? So if you look at Singapore Island from Google, the satellite view, you will see that the coast looks very angular. And that's because most of it is reclaimed. So you see all these red, that's all reclaimed, right? Um, and so you got reclamation, but we also saw a lot of rivers dammed. So they don't no longer flow to the sea because that was for drinking water, right? And to prevent flooding of urban areas, there was a lot of canalization. So that's to extract water after a rainfall. If you talk to older Singaporeans, they remember very many famous places flooding, right? Every time there's a rain. Hari Raya or guaranteed it's uh, flooding. Right, so canalization was meant to quickly remove water from urban areas. Right, so that means uh, for an otter, the forest streams uh, were intact, they're still intact, they are in our central catchment, but these are very small streams. Right, the moment you go out of central catchment, you meet canals, and when you reach the coast, it's all reclaimed. Now, this will be true of practically every Southeast Asian city. It's the natural trend during development, right? So if it hasn't come to a city now, it will come in the future. So when I travel, I can see the patterns, right? Which uh, in Singapore happened very rapidly during the 70s. So no habitat, no wildlife, lah, right? Uh, not, not very complicated. So uh, our focus was quite different, lah. So 70s, 80s, 90s, we are focused on different things. Very materialistic things. But around the 90s, they suddenly started to have a yearning right, for nature, which we will see amplified in 2001 at a place called Chik Jawa. Hundreds and thousands of people turn up. Right? So uh, happily for us, the government had declared uh, area as a nature space and the authors would return to it. So in the meantime, we are all speculating, you know, are they going to come back? Uh, we occasionally see like one author turned up, then he'll play in the mangrove, then he'll disappear. So um, we know there's a source for authors to return, right? Although they're gone, 
Malaysia is across Johor Strait, so there's a source. Then by the 90s, the environment is quite clean, right? There was a lot of cleanups. Then there's food. So although the fish are not native Singapore species, they are big uh, fish which are in the waterways and nothing is catching them. They're just a few fishermen. So the waterways are full of food, right? And then along the coast, there is mangrove and sandy beaches, not, not internally, but you know, only in the coast. So there's actually unoccupied space. So there's big potential, right? So we, 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 in 19, by 1994, we said, well, they will surely return. Now. And indeed, uh, in 1998, they came. So immigration from Malaysia, right? They came through to Sungai Buloh wetlands and they raised pups. That's the absolute sign that they are resident, right? Because the pups can't swim so far. So they raised pups in Sungai Buloh. So that seemed perfect because, you know, we conserve Sungai Buloh and a long lost wildlife uh, species turned up. But they also turned up in Pulau Ubin and Pulau Tokong. Uh, Pulau Tokong was, you know, meant for military training. So it's quite, um, you know, it's quite rugged terrain. So it's, it's quite ideal, right? So the military uses it, not a lot of public can go, uh, then the otters turn up, right? Uh, Pulau Ubin was very different at that time, right? The plans, were to ultimately reclaim it, but in 2001, government said, okay, no, we're going to keep it as it is. So, and they started greening it. Huh? So Ubin is very green. You should definitely go and visit it. It's a very unique space in Singapore, right? So we have a source, which is Malaysia, and we have a sink, and they returned. Lah. So you look at this, huh? this is Sungai Buloh at the bottom, and then this part is Malaysia. Huh? So the rest of it is urbanized. So for animals, they'll move between one green patch and another. Now we look at it as a national boundary, right? But for the animals, this is just a stream. Lah. Okay, lah, so just cross and move in between, lah. right? So between refugias is the fate of animals throughout the world now, every country of the world. How do we connect refugia so that there ends up being more space? So luckily when we declared a nature reserve here, uh, it became a receptor for the Johor site. Now, the question is, okay, although we have some nature reserve, but, you know, inland is all concrete waterway. Right? So, remember, all of these are urban canals, and these occupy the larger space, right? The uh, area of urban canals. So, in Singapore, from the beginning, to prevent us turning into a concrete dust bowl, there is a vision for a garden city. And this vision changes. So now you will hear them talk about city in nature. Initially, it's just, just plant anything, whatever you can get. And, and they gave, they even gave uh, saplings out to people. Just go and plant. Uh, when we develop our HDB estates, uh, it, it was like complete removal of original vegetation. So there was nothing. And that could have turned into a dust bowl. So government was quite concerned and said, okay, keep planting. And then later on, the planting vision became more mature. They say, oh, it must, you know, we must connect the spaces. We must vary the kind of trees we plant. So it kept evolving. And, you know, half a century later, we have a wonderful connectivity. So um, from your institute, uh, you can cycle to NUS, uh, by keeping on park connectors, right? The, the only part where you might die is Commonwealth. Lah. So you would have made 90% of the journey. I'm trying to figure out a, a good way to overcome that. But uh, you can be cycling along Singapore River, then uh, Alexandra River, right? And then you go past Buena Vista, all without encountering traffic right? And next to a waterway. So that's really impressive. Uh, I mean, we are very densely congested. Lah. So this picture of East Coast, uh, yeah, I think increased by four times. Huh? Uh, and then now with COVID, everyone's not traveling. So they are all in that space. It's a little bit stuff, but you still can find your way across Singapore and it's quite shaded. Now the rivers, when I was a schoolboy growing up, the river was black. So there, nothing in it could live. So this Kalang River, uh, this picture of 
is of Singapore River, but my school was next to Kalang River. Now, the bottom picture is actually showing them taking out dead pigs. So when there were floods, the farms also would get flooded and then sometimes the carcasses would go into the river um, and it was completely black. You know, so when we played football and if you're the one that kicked the ball and it went out, well, nobody will come and help you recover the ball. It's, it was incredibly stinky. And this is the fate of rivers throughout human civilization, right? From uh, India to London to Rome, they, they use it as a refuse, right? And then later on, they realize, hey, uh, river is a lifeline. We got to clean it up. So one by one, everyone started cleaning up and included Singapore, right? So, and, and in Singapore, the urgency is even more because we want drinking water. So with that kind of motivation, uh, we got established 17 reservoirs, right? And all the rivers in them were cleaned up, right? Singapore River actually took 10 years of effort. Lah. They even changed the kind of industries that were around the water. So this is my school, right? And this is a waterway which I would not have stepped into when I was a student, but now it's perfectly fine even for otters, right? But besides cleaning up the river, the canalization of the rivers, actually that one wasn't helpful to wildlife. So in those days, canals uh, is, okay, you got flooding, we'll take away the water. But this kind of canal is not helpful to wildlife. So the slopes are very steep. In fact, they don't even want people to go near lah. Because you go in this place, if there's a sudden storm, then you might get washed away. So people can die in canals, you know. Uh, curious school kids who go in, uh, they've been washed away. And there's minimum disturbance to the canal. You see these stairs? Very grudgingly, they have a few stairs. They don't want anything to slow down the speed of the water. Right? So it's dangerous. they got vertical walls, so it's a death trap for wildlife, uh, then the vision change. How can we use so much of space just to drain cities and nothing else? Singapore, you know, we struggle for space. So there must be multiple users. And this is something which is our pride and joy. It's a naturalized canal, multiple use. People are encouraged to use the space. So PUB, which was in charge of the project, they had to get new people in, you know, because the old thinking is keep people away. Now you completely change it, you needed people with new thinking. Then how to interface with the public? PUB never had to interface with the public. So they actually got a lot of help from MPARTS, which is the agency that says, okay, come to the park, use the space sensibly, we teach you, uh, how to look for the butterflies and birds and all that. So this is a very good project and it's showcased to visitors who visit us from around the world, right? But only one canal. Uh. We are extending it a bit towards Bradel, but only one canal. That's why those visions are so important. City in nature, let's naturalize more canals. So that's a vision for future, right? So these sloping banks with vegetation and the vegetation cover has increased. There's been more planting scenes. Uh, I'll tell you the significance in relation to otters later or you'll see. Lah. Okay, so is there food? Yeah, look at all these big fish, right? Do you know they are mostly not native, right? Uh, see where they're from? Africa, America, completely different continents, not even Asia, right? And they do very well. So look at the size of the fish. These are all taken by my student. When we try to study, since the otters are so close, let's just photograph. Uh. No need to look at the fecal matter. That's so tough. And, and it turned out it's possible, right? Because uh, the fish are so big. So, okay, there's food, right? Uh, they can travel in the urban waterways, although it's not that attractive to live in. So can they use the space? Uh, so these are otters drying their fur on grass, right? They're not that fussy, you know, after all. Grass also can. Ah, don't need natural vegetation. 
So you can see, uh, you know, uh, canoes rowing in the background. This near the Singapore Sports Stadium. And then look at this. They're using mulch. This is fertilizer for the tree. They say, okay, no problem. Uh, we'll dry up there. And there's a big family. Huh? This gardens by the bay. East. And then, okay, the privates of all this will use sand, right? Or clay. Uh, now, the reason why otters have to dry their fur is they're not waterproof, right? They're water resistant. So after some time, if they're immersed in water too long, they'll start to get the chill and they can die. Now, in the 70s, there were zoos that didn't give otters a lot of uh, land within the enclosure and many died. From pneumonia. So a friend of mine who was working with zoos uh, corrected them and then their survival improved. So they're not waterproof, they must find spaces to come up and dry their fur. And look at that, they've gone straight back in the water, right? Yeah, but now because the fur is oil and it's, the water has all been squeezed out, uh, they're good to go for uh, quite a while. Now, the other thing is, where can they hide? It's very important for animals to find a safe space to rest. And they're using urban structures. So underneath urban structures, uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, outside all looks nice. Underneath the urban structure, a lot of unfinished construction, right? And they're using the spaces. If they have to squeeze in, better. If a predator or a competitor comes after them, and they have to squeeze in their disadvantage. Very easy to slap at them and keep them at bay. So, okay, urban environment, no problem for smooth-coated otters. And of course, you know, as scientists, we're like, hey, how many are we monitoring? Uh, where are they? So we don't have eyes all over the island. So we ask people. We've been asking people for the longest time. Now. Have you seen mammals in Singapore? Because people in urban areas can provide us urban records and then we focus on the forest now. And, and you can see they are providing records of otters, civets, banded leaf monkey, samba deer, and we share this information with all the wildlife biologists in Singapore so that we have a better understanding of what's going on and how to help them. So when Facebook became more popularly used, then we went on uh, and we started a page, right? Initially, it was asking the public for records. And then now it's a space where we communicate information to them. Lah. So this was 30,000 before. Now I think it's like 50,000. And there's another page, Otter City, which is about 180,000, right? So, okay. By 2015, we could figure out what's going on. We had multiple families that had spread because they could use the urban space there was food, uh, places to rest, uh, to hide their cups, uh, dry their fur. Okay, so Singapore's green plan, green and blue plan, actually worked for urban adaptable species like the author. So 1998, we had the first pair at Bulo. Then we had these uh, groups in Ubin and Tekong, right? And over time, they start spreading Sometimes you see the dots are very small and that's because it's individual author looking for space, then can find a mate, start a family, right? Uh, now, this is June 2013. By now, they've been seen in East Coast, right? Sentosa, and then finally, they turn up Marina Bay, 2014, Chinese New Year. Uh, we called the guy Ahuat. And then Ahuat, when he was coming out of the water, I was tracking him in gardens, gardens by the Bay. He stood up and he called. Then we got very excited. That means he has a mate. Now, the mate couldn't be seen right. That means the female is pregnant. She will stop coming out when she's ready to give birth. So the Gardens by the Bay staff and myself, we left Ahuat alone because we figure out, uh, don't put him under so much pressure. Let him be. And then later on, the pups appeared. Right? So by 2015, they, they, the smooth-coated otter turns up in Bishan. 
And that's a very significant time because it meant the authors turned up in the heartlands of Singapore. So nowhere in the world can you get heartlanders, right, uh, seeing wildlife like otters at their doorstep. It was unimaginable. So people around the world used to follow, well, they follow our Facebook pages, about half of them are international visitors, right? So by 2017, we said, okay, let's do a, another population assessment. And by now, the number of authors had reached about 90, maybe about 11 families. And we think that number has doubled because there's a current survey that another student just did. So it sort of reached the maximum capacity, right? Uh, and so in many areas, um, auto watchers have witnessed fights between families. They're territorial, right? So in these fights, uh, it's like a self-limiting factor for how many authors Singapore can host. So we kind of reach our maximum already. Lah. So, okay, if you think uh, a population increased by births and immigration, decreased by death and emigration. So we have a certain number of deaths. We think about 10%. Uh, and that's simply contributed by road kill. You travel between areas. It's not continuous forest, right? So it's quite dangerous. Okay, you get killed by traffic. The other way you die is if you're born and you're not so fit, you can't follow the family. Uh, then we've seen uh, litters of pups, maybe six at Botanic Garden, then slowly decline until only two survive. It's very harsh now, but it's a uh, law of the jungle acting on if there's a slight genetic defect, right? Uh, the otter pups may not be able to keep up. Yeah, and it, and it works for any animal, right? For civets, for owls, for kingfishers, whatnot. So yes, otters have problems like the rest of us. They move between uh, nice habitats they are able to use, but not completely connected. So they have to take their chances. So that was the dad of a family that raised their pups near Fort Road. So every day, uh, he would have to run the risk, right? Well, MPAX did put up signs, but, you know, signs have a limited uh, effect. So some animals get killed. We will go and recover carcass if we are notified. Uh, we send it to the zoo nowadays where the pathologist will do and autopsy, determine cause of death and all this. So this is normal when you have wildlife in the city that you monitor it in some way. So when there are factors affecting them, uh, we will know early. So actually for roadkill, uh, animal deaths, we monitor them very closely. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, happily now, there is national institutions to support. So M Parks and uh, Mandai Nature, that's the zoo, right? Uh, they have vets and pathologists. So it's done in a more professional way now. So in Singapore, not much conflict. I mean, there, there are uh, authors that go into private property and uh, when they complain, we provide advice. Lah. But generally, mostly they love authors. Uh, and a variety of people are very heartened to see wildlife in the city. I don't know why, like they love otter so much. Macaques, like not so much. What's the story there, right? So, you know, sometimes your, your PR appeal, right, just can't make sense. I, macaques, I think we've learned to fear them uh, because they can snatch things because they're smarter. Lah. Uh, but it's kind of tragic because there's so much to learn from observing long-term macaques. So we're actually more experienced with macaques and we brought that experience over to help with our management of authors. And Singaporeans, not bad, you know, they are what we describe as nature deficit. 
That means he didn't grow up in nature, not even kampong. So, uh, you know, they're scared of dogs, they're scared of cats, scared of everything. Lah. But with the author, it's such a magnetic appeal. And then when we are there to advise them, mostly they listen. No? We just say, hey, uh, give them their space and then they listen. So that's been quite uh, delightful. Right? And, and the media also love them. So all their sins are forgiven. Lah. Yeah, so when they went to eat koi at Sentosa, everyone's sympathy was with the author and definitely not the Sentosa residents. I, I did go down and talk to the Sentosa folk. Lah. So, you know, if you open your door every day and look at your koi, you build a relationship. So it's quite shocking to see when they're like, essentially they're murdered. Lah. Because koi, ah, they're like toy fish, you know, they're, they're not native. They're put in an artificial pond that doesn't provide them with avenue for any avenue for escape. So it's really an unfair situation. And uh, but we never had an aquatic predator. So now Singapore is having to adapt. I didn't realize we had so many koi ponds. It's crazy. So I think there was a push for water features in landscape. And uh Koi somehow attracted a lot of people. The, the price can vary uh, from very cheap to very expensive. And National University of Singapore, where I'm from, at University Hall, that's like the showcase, the center space. You come there, there's koi. Not Southeast Asian fish, you know. Koi. You want to see Southeast Asian fish? Go to Ku Tek Pot Hospital, which is linked to Yishun Pond. That's a more enlightened... Uh, landscaping. NUS, yeah, I still got to persuade them. Lah. So this has led to a lot of what we call conflict. And you have to go down and advise. In some areas, the estate managers are quite smart. Lah. So we tell them, look for this get, that get, they can solve it very quickly. Other places, they seem like, you know, they struggle to understand. And then the third environment, actually we can't help. It's too open. So like NUS, too open. So when the authors turned up there recently, I told them uh, they will come and makan your fish, right? They can't eat all your fish. So you better move it. So they resisted. Then the authors visited again. Oh, and then they quickly move everything. So we are having to adapt to a new situation, which is city in nature. Uh, besides otters, there will be hornbills and straw header bubble and civets and a lot of these bring joy to us, but we need to adjust, right? So there's an actress, Jezri Lo, she has a business now, uh, fairly open compound within Bishan Amokyo Park. So the otters came in and uh, decimated all the fish, right? So she's understanding, so she said, uh, no, no, no. When people talk about culling, she said, no, that's not right. So uh, MPAX went down to provide advice about how to autoproof the estate. So it requires what we call exclusion strategies. But you know, a lot of new places like the condo, they build next to Alexandra. Authors have always been there before the condos. Then the condo fence, very uh, nice, right? But you can't keep anything out lah. So it's decorative. So the authors slide through and went to feast on the fish. But guess what? The fish wasn't supposed to be there. It was a bioswale. It's a design that captures water to clean it up before you return to water. <laughs> so the whole thing is a disaster. So we have to work together to help them figure all this out. Now. So I've been talking so far, smooth quarter author. What about small claw otter? Ah, interestingly, uh, only in Ubin and Tekong, and not, uh, not a lot of them. So what we realize is the small claw otter requires small mangrove streams. So the work in Ubin to restore Ubin mangrove, right? Uh, it's an ongoing piece of work, very important to provide a space for small claw otters. Now this is happening all around Asia. The smooth kota otters will adapt and survive if the rivers are clean. And I told you that every city wants clean rivers, but the small claw otter will slowly die out. So internationally, this is an area of concern. So the work that we do in Ubin and Takong is quite important. 
Um, okay, so we have authors in our city. Then how often do we interfere? Um, we, we've seen what we do with birds, right? Now, mm -hmm. if a bird falls out of a nest, the advice we will give you is just return it to the nest. Cannot return, put it in a place the parents can see. Don't keep it. Don't let your scent get mixed up with all these rescue animals. Okay? So there is some interference in that. We will try to assist animals in urban spaces, right? And for long-tail macaques, we have a long history of working with them. We always have to decide because you take one macaque out, even if it seems there's a broken arm, you know, you go in, capture that macaque, the whole troop is in distress, right? It's very traumatic for the individual animal as well. So we learn from these practices and realize, oh, the wildlife is quite resilient. You, you feel like you want to rush in, right? Like how you might want to help a human, but there are different standards for wildlife and the cost of your interference can result in other damage. So it's something we think about all the time, right? Now, this was a case in Pasiris where the author had a wire cutting into the body and it looks like it's exposing the flesh, right? I mean, it was, right? So we actually had to figure out how to rescue. Look at the people involved, right? So there's vets from the zoo, right? There's MPARCs that establish an enclosure. There were auto watchers who told us where is the best space and time to do it. So I was coordinating it with my experience, right? And we managed to return the author to its family, right? So the cut was sealed up. It was given, uh, you know, anti-parasite boost, vitamins and all that. And it returned to the family. And even until today, it's alive and well. This is Aquarius, right? So we do interfere when the justification is strong. And we have a decision tree that we worked out and we subject for international review, then guess what? We realize we are the experts because where else is there? Authors in urban spaces. So in Singapore, we have to stop looking at others, figure out using the wealth of information that's available and decide on a plan, right? And then others are looking at this to figure out what to do. So in February, hopefully, I joined the Malaysians. We have a big discussion about this because otters are turning up in Klang River. And right now, before I came online, we were discussing this case where the pup seems to have paralyzed hind legs. So do we interfere or not? So that whole decision tree is being evaluated. Uh, some people are going down now to see if the condition is deteriorating, we may interfere right, on, on humane grounds. So yeah, we got to learn quite a lot of things very quickly, unlike field studies. We, we could see that otters are not diurnal. When I was doing my research, I was tracking them in Malaysia without a torchlight, upwind, so they can't stem. Oh my goodness, look at what they're doing in Singapore. So if they're comfortable, most animals will be diurnal. They can see easier. The reason why a number of them have turned nocturnal is to avoid people. So yeah, we got a ringside seat. We can figure this out. Look at this formation they're swimming in in order to hunt for fish. Right? It's like an arrowhead formation. And then they force the fish into the shallows. right? And then uh, they can pick at their prey. Yeah, this is taken with handphone. Now. So they're very close to me. I just stayed completely still and they ended up next to me. So they are what we call habituated, right? And, and you can see here is the effect of herding, right? That increased the success of, uh, of their breakfast. And look at this, see how they eat fish. They eat from the head first, you know. We're like, huh? The fleshy part on the side of the body, right? No, they like to eat from the head first. But if it's a catfish, uh, oh, no, no, no. That head is too hard. So eat from tail down, poor catfish, uh, right? Because uh, if it eats you head first, you definitely get killed much earlier, right? And then the sprains provide us a lot of information. And I told you about how we know a lot of what they're eating is foreign, right? It's from the studies of the fish. We can even tell you which size fish they prefer, right? 
So it's between 15 to 19 cm. These, these are quite large fish. Mm -hmm. la. So actually, if you keep a koi pond and your fish are 5 cm, they're quite safe. La. Okay, and then space was quite surprising. Initially, when they raised parks, oh, Bishan or Mercure Park, enough. Then uh, when the parks grew up, not enough. They came out and then they started to have fights in Marina Bay. So the otter families, they don't disperse. There's not a lot of alternate place for you to grow up and live. So they're like, you know, uh, three generations in one flat. Yeah, so the numbers, you see, keep growing, right? The numbers keep increasing. And then Bishan in 2017, they reached 16. Uh, later on, more recently, they reached 22, right? So they stay together. And we realized actually the successful groups had good parents. Bishan dad is phenomenal. We all have mighty respect from him. Not every dad is as good, no? Some are so blur when they are trying to teach the pups to swim. The otter watcher is like, oh my God, he's going to drown the pups. Then the mom will come and smack him away. So Bishan dad, when he passed away, on Auto Watch, if you go, we still honor him. Because in wildlife, uh, not every individual knows how to be a good parent. So must be very appreciative when you do see. Uh, right? So Central Watershed, and that's right next to your campus, right? Singapore River, Kalang River, Marina Bay, uh, Bishan Amokyo, uh, up to Queenstown and Botanic Gardens. This is a very important space, highly desirable, right? It's the Bukitima of otter habitats and they fight to stay here. So I'll give you a simple example. Bishan 16, right? When he's raising pups, they all stay around the pup. So Zook 6, it's, it's named after a former nightclub, uh, Zook, along the Singapore River, right? They raise pups because Bishan 16 was confined to Kalam Basin. When they raise pups, they don't move around so much. Then the pups got older. And after the pups learned how to swim, they brought them to their old home range. And there was a fight with Zook 16 and Zook 16 had to leave, right? So this is what a fight looks like. There'll be a lot of vocalization, very directed focus, and the weaker family run away. Lah. Now, what we notice when two families fight, if the other family stays to fight, usually one of the pups will be killed. And it seems to be the deal breaker. The moment one of the pups is killed, the other family will retreat. And this happened a few times. Lah. So we have at our doorstep a wonderful opportunity to learn about wildlife. In the rest of Asia, they are doing what I did, which is very hard work, you know, going into deep forests. So it's really tough to learn. So we feel we have a responsibility, try to share, document what we see, write it up and share it with our network of Asian scientists. So this is what we do. And I do it with the help of all my students, right? And, and so that work gets to Asia through the scientific papers and the network. Then locally, we work in working groups to advise about how we want to manage wildlife. So in Singapore, uh, 2013 to 2015, we culled 1,500 macaques. Can you imagine that? That's the equal of the total population, about 500 a year, just by responding to complaints. That agency no longer exists. Now, MPAX is in charge, and at the working group, uh, we have agreed there are other ways to handle the situation. In a case where a macaque attacks a person, really attacks a person, no provocation and attacks, then we are resigned to the fact that we need to take the individual out, right? So, but we're talking about maybe one or two individuals a year compared to, say, 500. So, when we handle wildlife better, more ethically, and it's science-based, the general society uh, prefers it. 
and we can feel better about ourselves, right? And then it's important to share these experiences with others. So, you know, I come from NUS, my students are researchers, right? But very grateful to members of the public for all the observations they share, the help they give, uh, keep my students safe as well, right? And we all combine forces to engage in public education. So these are war mammals that people can see in Singapore, right? Uh, sometimes you get partners who are quite havoc. Lah. So this PA, they put some poor guy in an otter suit. It's highly successful, right? Uh, and then at events like this, we get to uh, educate our political leaders as well. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. There's a limit to natural populations of wildlife. And the Facebook pages, phenomenally successful and we are sharing half of the subscribers are international, right? So Korea is very interested in what we are doing. Uh, the Taiwanese were as well. The Malaysians are as well. Wherever the author can return to urban spaces. So what we do in Singapore is careful to organize and share so that others can make use of it. And you, you know, you look at Google Maps, SDH Institute. I think one of the things you should try to do is make sure you see an author, right? You're in the main battleground of Singapore, you know, central Singapore watershed, and then get some exercise while you're doing it. Not so easy to spot. Huh? It's a big space. Yeah. But once you find them, you'll know how to find them. So that's it, folks. I just wanted to say it's so wonderful that we have these authors here. And as people who are in hospitality and tourism, acquire the knowledge because they are right at your doorstep in CBD. But then realize also that there are authors everywhere and in many places they require your help. So the first thing is awareness and I'm glad you're here with me today to learn a bit more about authors in our backyard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seva, for the great insights. Uh, okay, so we all have the opportunity now to ask questions, right? So does anyone want to go first? You can ask or you can type in. Yeah, you can either ask or type it in, whichever you prefer. And any question is welcome. Shall we let Jane Goodall ask a question first? <laughs> Careful, I'll dominate. <laughs> I got lots of questions. So, so I think I love the whole. Um, what people don't realize is that Siva and his team brought these otters back from the brink of extinction, and we, we are the otter capital of the world, right? So people come on otter watching holidays here because of you, Siva. So you know you are a you should be STB's uh, poster person. <laughs> Uh, Actually, I should. Uh, okay, I must. I must interject at that point because I had nothing to do with otters returning. Okay. okay. What What caused otters to return is that southern Malaysia didn't develop at the pace of Singapore, so they were a refugia for a lot of wildlife, right? Uh, which has returned to Singapore, including hornbills and, and straw-headed bubbles and the like. The second thing was the government vision of clean and green city that now has become city in nature, it, it wasn't meant for wildlife. But by conservation of resources, cleaning of ruinous rivers and greening of these adjacent areas, that laid a platform for the otters to return. So we needed a source, but we also needed to clean up. Yeah. So no, I'm just a observer here to I'm the head cheerleader la, that's all yeah. <laughs> go ahead so yes was there a question <laughs> yeah actually I have a, another half to that to that statement you know, the students that uh, SDH have they come from all over the world a lot of them are from Southeast Asia so what is the otter situation in places like the Philippines um, India I'm thinking of where our students are from, right? Yeah. Vietnam. Vietnam. So in uh, Philippines, they have the small claw otter in Palawan Island, only in Palawan Island. So that's quite precious. 
Uh, there is conservation groups there, uh, rescue and rehabilitation groups, but there are other pressures, habitat loss, wildlife trade. Uh, in most of Southeast Asia is the same. So you do have respectable organizations. And actually I was talking with uh, Murali and Jesslyn, and I said, if SDH has their schools everywhere, and they're using the autumn mascot, I can give them contacts of people to link to. So they, they know about the authors in their country and they can initiate uh, support by funding from tourists or whoever they intersect with because uh, the dollars in Southeast Asia go a long way. Yeah. And I, I know these Southeast Asian uh, researchers, we have a network, we've met them and there are a lot of very good people who have accomplished uh, very good things. For example, uh, my friend in Cambodia also put up a presence in the local universities to encourage Cambodians interested in uh, uh, graduate studies to be mentors and show them opportunities. So then you do capacity building, yeah. Thailand has four species, which is incredible. Yeah, actually, can I say something? Yeah. No. Siva, um, yeah. my name is Fred. I'm one of the lecturers. Um, actually, since you mentioned about uh, SDH outlets or branches, we don't have a lot of outlets, although we have sister <laughs> schools in Myanmar. But we do have quite a number of partners. In the Philippines, we have around six and now about seven locations where we, or five locations in different parts of the country where we run our courses. So with the introduction of this mascot, I think we can, we can uh, you know, collaborate with our partners and then maybe you can connect <clears throat> our students to, <clears throat> to, to those locations. We don't have anyone in, we don't have a, a partner in Palawan, but we do have one in Cagayan de Oro, then Cebu, the, some of the major cities. We also have a partner in, uh, in Thailand. Mm. We also have a partner in Thailand. And now we have one of our former students uh, has put up his training school in Vientiane. So it's a good thing also that probably mm. this could be part of SDH what do you call CSR around yeah. the around the author, you know, a team or yes. we capitalize on the mascot just to share yeah. with you and perhaps something can be done uh, in that area. Uh -huh. Thank you. Mm. Any other questions? Uh, can I ask a question? I'm, uh, I'm TK, uh, yeah. I'm the managing hi, director. Hi, hi. Yeah, Sydney. he's the MD of the school. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the very um, uh, interesting and very nice and lively uh, presentation. Right. Um, I just one very simple question. I, I'm, I'm quite sure some, some of the students may, may have the same question. How, how do you tell uh, what from your Aquarius and Alien Farbing? Well, I mean, I, how, mm. how do you tell? The author together. I mean, to us, it's like they all look the same. Right? They are quite hard to differentiate. Right. So we can tell by the presence of the entire family. So, you know, okay, there's a family of nine around Pasiris. And then there's a family of six nearby. So when you see the nine, we know which family it is. Some individuals may have a mark, like, uh, a slight mark on the forehead or the side of the body could be an injury and then that's how they zoom in and then for people who watch them every day like the auto watchers or my students they can distinguish by the personality so some are more timid some are more uh, bold yeah so it's a whole series of parameters okay. so uh, that yeah. There, there is a giant otters in South America when they uh, uh, you know want to do when they're trying to look for the researcher and they pop their heads out they have chest markings 
and she could use it to identify individuals. That's for giant otters, not for ours. Awesome. So one of the students had asked, uh, does otters only eat fish? Um, our otters will eat prawns in the mangrove, 20% of the diet. So I think if mangroves are, uh, prawns are available in the mangrove, they will eat as well. This for the smooth coated, right? The small cloth eats small fish, small crabs in mangroves. There is a third species, which is the Eurasian otter, which you will find in Thailand. And that one will eat, it's, it's less aquatic. It, it will also hunt on the terrestrial side. They can take wild birds. Yeah. And do they have uh, other predators that they have to be cautious of? Uh, they are a top predator. The time for caution is with the young. Uh, the young are vulnerable to anything, la, python, monitor lizard. But uh, once they are fully grown, and because they are in a group, we see them harassing crocodiles at Sungai oh. Bulo. Yeah. So if they see a, another top predator, they will give it a bad time. La, oh. So that they don't get too comfortable in the space. Awesome. So they are fairly territorial, aren't they? Yeah, they won't tolerate another group in the same space because that means there'll be less food for them to eat. Another question that come up, what if someone is bitten by an otter? <laughs> Does so that happen? The idea is to not get bitten and then the mantra is watch from a distance. The reason why you might not follow the advice is if you're looking at the animal through your handphone. Then you're trying to capture that shot, right? And if your handphone lens, the zoom is not great, you keep going closer. So this is always a problem when authors have pups. Members of public with handphones getting too close. So if author watchers are nearby, they tell them, hey, you got to keep a distance. But some people are stubborn and they get nipped. I won't say they get bitten. Uh, otter, you've seen it slicing the fish head, right? Yeah. They nip you, and it will draw blood. Lah. Yeah, but then you got your warning, and you have to back off. What should you do? Yeah, then, you know, apply first aid. Uh, we normally tell people, go clean it. Yeah. One person just got nipped uh, two days ago. Went too close. When they have pups, they are less tolerant of you getting too close because you're a threat. Okay. Any other questions? I have a few. Um, you, you talked about exclusive strategies uh, at one stage where you talked about the new type of canal that are... So, what, what would be some of the exclusive strategies that are commonly, or you recommend that are adopted to uh, save them? Oh, so I was talking about exclusion for properties that otters are visiting. They swim in the pool, they eat your fish. Then it's the perimeter fence. Um, if the perimeter fence is very on it, then... Uh, planting of this dense tawny bushes can keep them out or you put in fencing but usually these don't look nice so you surround with vegetation vegetation uh, in, in older properties it's just about ceiling gaps okay so uh, otters can climb uh, one meter they can clear okay to get into a space yeah so are these things that are being taken into consideration right now by NPARCs when they design uh, canals or, or, or features, well, water features? No, it's more for properties to uh, design. The parks are not meant to exclude animals. Anyway, the canals are PUB. La. They just want it. Get the water out. Don't interfere. Uh, so it's more the specific properties about fixing their fencing. 
Okay. Some are very fast, you know. There was a security team at the Alexandra condo, no, River Valley condo, and they fixed everything. By the time we went down the following day to provide advice, they solved all their problems. Okay. You also mentioned something about them being habituated, right? Um, do you see that as being a risk to their survival? Uh, not really. Um, I think the survival issues are more how they handle traffic. So we just had two killed by cars on Holland Road. Um, actually, I thought they'll die much earlier, but they survived quite long. This oh. is a group called Zook, which is wandering the urban areas because they can't find a space in the waterway. They are already resident families. So you got kicked out by Marina. They got kicked out by SBG. And they are now wandering the urban matrix. So you see them at Istana, see them at Bogotima, see them at Botanic Gardens. Uh, they even turned up at NUS. And they're trying to find a space to live, rest, and feed. Now, I didn't rate their chances very high, but they are amazing. In fact, they're the world's most urban authors in the world, easily. And the distance they cover in a single day, uh, it made my student really, really tired. Uh, before I deploy a student, I do find out their background. So this girl is a Frisbee player. La. She was very fit. So she could follow. Yeah. Sorry, uh, one more question. Uh, you did say that uh, we, have re did we reached the max of, uh, well, the comfortable number that our environment can handle, right? As far as authors go? Did you, yeah. Something like that. Uh, so what happens if this number just keeps going up? Are they going to become a, a menace or will it be a problem or will there be natural selection? So it's already peaked and that's why Zook is wandering Singapore. Right. And as people become smart and they put up exclusion measures, then this opportunistic feeding is going to go. That means that the future litters uh, will be smaller and then eventually they get wiped out. So there are natural limits to okay. the population of anything. When any population increases unnaturally, it's due to feeding. So uh, red jungle fowl populations, uh, long-tailed macaque populations, uh, pigeons minus crows, right? All this is due to human feeding of wildlife. Uh, recently, we passed a law that made feeding of wildlife illegal because we were trying to use anti-littering laws to catch people. It's just too difficult. Uh, that took two years, you know, to review. Uh, to be very careful about what we are imposing on society. So a lot of discussions with a lot of people and there's an upgraded uh, wildlife fact. Yeah. So uh, animal populations can't run amok. When they do, normally the problem is us. So there's a time when there were rats running amok at Bukit Batok. And it could have been that people were throwing bags of food for stray dogs. So that way of feeding is irresponsible. So the people who look after stray dogs, they have a procedure. They now work with AVS and they, there's even AVS advice about how to do it properly. So these are established methods of managing uh, urban stray populations that prevent uh, population explosions. Yeah. So the author situation with Zoop is a struggle to survive. And they are showing us where all the water bodies are, where all the, the fish are, uh, where they can navigate traffic. I think, or we think during COVID, the traffic density was lower. So it extended the possibility of them surviving. 
And then now, um, people at fish ponds, they're realizing, hey, I want to protect my fish. So as they get smarter, there's fewer opportunities for them. And so they are traveling further and further. And that's stressful, which will mean they can't raise a lot of pups. Interesting. So Han Lin has asked another question about what do you do if you see an injured pup? Uh, do you uh, call NPARCs or Acres? Yeah, either would do. Okay. So NPARCs now has a 24-hour hotline and they also have a wildlife management division. This all didn't exist in the past. Acres has been the wildlife charity, which we all support. Uh, and they emerged more than a decade ago. So the time for me to like look after abandoned animals in my lab uh, while I'm writing my thesis, you know, I have a civet jumping on my chest, uh, that's all over. We now have national charities and institutions and we all work together as working group. So when you call Acres or you call MPARCs, the WhatsApp chat we all share, the case turns up and then we update each other. Interesting. Any other questions, guys? Can I ask one, uh, one question? Is, is there any concern that um, the, 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 um, the waters may one day disappear? Because, you know, when some of the fishes in the, in the river has been needed now, you know, because, because there were no predators before, and now, now you have waters family, and, uh, and the food may, they become scarce and they may, may go, go to greener pasture you know, right across the strait again to Malaysia. Is there such a concern? Uh, no, because the, uh, it boils down to otter territoriality. Uh, Bishan keeps a space which is quite big because they don't hunt in one space all the time. They'll move on. And what prompts them to move on is when it gets harder to catch fish. Yeah. So they can't deplete a fish population. It gets harder to catch, move on, and then you keep moving on, right? So you rotate between feeding grounds. But ah, what if someone else comes and use your feeding ground? That's why they will drive them away. So these are inbuilt balances that doesn't result in extinction of species. There's, there's always this check and balance. When you see extinction of species, uh, usually we are involved. Uh, we, we do something stupid, which we seem to be quite good at. Uh. So <laughs> now, can they return to Johor? Uh, not really, you know. What's happening in Johor is the kind of land use change we saw in Singapore in the 60s and 70s. So there's Project Iskandar, there is uh, all refineries and the like. So a lot of habitat is disappearing. I look at it more that eventually when all of that finishes its cycle, then they will want green environments, they will want refugia wildlife to return and all that. And then maybe if you've done a good job, we can return the favor. We can be the source to their sink. Uh, what we can't provide is the largest animals. Elephants, tigers, rhino. Yeah, that one's all out. Yeah, but for the uh, medium and small, we can be a source again. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how we wish that that this pairing will not happen because we, right, it will carry on for generations to come. And as a school, um, what, how do we, how, you know, in what way can we contribute to the um, conservation or as you will, or to support your effort in, uh, in this author? Well, you know, research? we've seen such dramatic decline. That's my experience. The good news for the students is the current experience is one of recovery, restoration, conservation. So they are more aware of all these issues because they're more acute. And uh, general appreciation by the public is quite important. So although authors are in 
CBD, a lot of people still haven't seen them, don't know about them. So if you're in hospitality and tourism in Singapore, in the CBD is very easy. Uh, become aware of the authors, go and look at them. It's not just authors, there are also hornbills and kingfishers. And now these are very uh, basic. Uh, but my students in university are clueless. So when we bring them out, we are giving them really uh, basic introduction to very common birds. Now, the tourists are like my students. They are, well, not really. Uh, there's a proportion of them who are highly informed. Mm -hmm. So then what you must be able to do is direct them to the right people to go to, right? Then there's the proportion which doesn't specifically care. But on a holiday, they experience great delight in these kind of encounters. But the bay is very big. So being able to tell them, oh, you go to this specific place or this specific place, uh, this is a kind of experiences you can have. Uh, it simply means that the individual, you know, working the floor must have a wider appreciation of topics beyond their specific role, right? So if they experience this during their schooling, say you get placed in some hotel in Myanmar, you're able to pick up, okay, uh, what's around us? What could I direct people to? And if you look at, um, what's their webpage? Uh? It's also crowdsourced for, for visitors. People go in and put ratings and all that. Oh, trip Trip advisor? advisor? Trip advisor, yes. Yeah. So for example, in Trip Advisor, uh, when I was in Langkawi, there was information about mass kind of uh, opportunities, right? But there was also very good information about which was ecologically sensitive. So tours that allow you to buy chicken skin to feed the eagles in Langkawi is detrimental to their health. But there are operators that refuse to do that. So we went with those operators and we had a really good time. So, you know, I'm a mangrove expert and the guy was a former office worker from Kedah and he became a tour guide and he's book smart. So he read a lot of stuff up from birds, but he managed to be a very effective guy, right? And, and I told him so at the end. So the, the information shared by tourists who are seeking out this kind of experience is going up now and they represent a, a, a niche crowd. So for if you're in tourism and hospitality, some basic awareness of what you can see around you, I think is of uh, increasing importance today. It also means that if say you're visiting a city, there's so many ways to enhance your experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. There's so much that we want to do as well, uh, Siva, and uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but we do need to talk about stuff like what our students can do to uh, get more involved in learning more about the otters. Uh, can they go otter watching with you, for example? Uh, do you do those kind of stuff uh, for your students in NUS? Uh, can our students tag along? <laughs> so. Um we usually ask people to go and find themselves because the hunt improves your awareness of nature. And then you pick up not just authors, but the variety of things that are going on around you. Also, we tell students to observe people around them and how they are interacting with the space around them. And there's also a lot of heritage uh, within that same space. So there's so many layers. Uh, when you follow a directed uh, tour for authors, you, you kind of get tunnel vision. And working for it means you become a better proponent. So my students all have to go and find the author themselves. The giveaway in Marina Bay is when there's a crowd of people staring in the water, you found author. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there are 
tourists that come to Singapore just to see otters as well, I hear, right? Is that becoming yes. an attraction? Yeah, there are people who got married on the shore where the otters were frequently seen and they cooperated by turning up on the bank at the right time. Uh, that made the BBC News, I think. So there was a German, German uh, student. So he fiercely followed Singapore otters and I didn't meet him, but I linked him up with others and he saw about four or five families, met various different Singaporeans uh, and he, he's yearning for COVID to be over to return. So yeah, there are plenty of people visiting and searching and they get to know all of Singapore and the authors may draw them here, but then there are all the other attractions of the city that they can link up to. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So it's giving us some ideas on what we can do going forward uh, in this next few months of building this mascot uh, awareness among us. I, I think... Uh, in fact, I think you should try doing a project where the students collectively try to find them in Marina Bay. Because if you see them in one spot, say Gardens by the Bay is one evening, and that is shared in the WhatsApp chat, someone else goes the next morning. Highly likely to see them. So between the network of 30 odd people, you just uh, find a communication method and a coordination method. And it's quite fun uh, tracking authors that way. Oh, okay. Right, right. Yeah. I, I have one question, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit curious because um, I'm down at Changi Sailing Club a lot and we have quite a few visitors down there from the Otter Society. Um, is there a difference between freshwater otters and seawater otters, or are they the same? No, they are all the same. Mm. So they favour the coast, but they will travel inland to look for habitats. So that coastal otter becomes a freshwater otter, and they are all called river otters. The right. exception is the sea otter that you see in your safe entry nowadays. Right. That really spends its life at sea off the coast of North America. Because we have quite we have quite some very big otters for some reason down on the on the uh, Changi site. Uh, and we're starting to see more and more now, especially when they come up when where the club is, they roll around on the beach. Um, yeah. But we've also seen a few incidents where they're now getting trapped inside netting and things of that nature, things like that. Is there anybody that sort of takes care of that now with the M parks? So uh, they are advisory to fishermen, mm. but there's a bit of a loophole in the Fisheries Act. So before that can get changed, you know, it takes a lot of consultation and all that. Uh, we won't, uh, laws don't change quickly. Every consideration must be made. We don't know if people are trapping for food. Do we need to impede that? Can, if they are knowledgeable about otters, they can normally avoid that. Yeah, there was an incident at Changi uh, Sailing Club before where yeah. two otters died. Yeah, and um, uh, that got resolved, but the threat of that happening again certainly is there. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've got to let him go. <laughs> Poor Silva, he's a very busy man. But I, I really thank you very much for having taken this time to... Uh, give us this education. Uh, we hope to be able to engage with you further um, as we move along. And uh, just remember, SDH Institute is not just a supporter for JGIS. We'd also like to help uh, uh, otters since it's our mascot. So let's stay engaged and let us know how we can help uh, and where are some of the areas we can contribute as well. Yeah, certainly. I think we your, you know, your student diversity, your sister schools, uh, you can think about something meaningful to be done for authors in Asia. I don't think it's very difficult. Uh, of course, you want to know you have credible partners and then that's where I can help. Sure. Brilliant. We do have a chat group going, so that's going to be, uh, that's going to remain active. And uh, thank you so much, Siva. Uh, thanks, everyone, for... Thanks a lot, everyone, for having me.
Well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And Thanks, everyone. Stay tuned for the next act. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.